As a curator of the Chipstone Foundation between 2000 and 2007, Glenn Adamson was the lead curator of 12 exhibitions mounted by that organization at the Milwaukee Art Museum. The subject matter exhibited is a testament to Glenn Adamson's wide-ranging interests and knowledge, attributes that he displayed as a member of the curatorial team for wood turning in North America since 1930. The shows that he curated at for Chipstone covered ceramics, furniture fakes, chinoiserie, African-American studies, artists like Eva Zeisel and Gord Pideron, industrial design and designers, contemporary textile art, and as they always say in ads and advertising, and more. When he left the Chipstone Foundation to take on responsibility for graduate student education at the Victoria and Albert Museum in London, Chipstone staff and board members knew that our loss would be the V&A's gain. Glenn Adams has a rare gift of being able to examine material culture from broad philosophical underpinnings and relate that information to specific subject matter clearly and intelligently. I have huge respect for Glenn's abilities and just wish him well now and in the future. So we're talking about how this show came about, but Pat has a really good question is, and Glenn, um, how did he get involved with the project? And you did the center's uh, International Turning Exchange in 96. Yep. And then you recommended oh. uh, Glenn. So why did you recommend him in 97? Because he was somebody with a deep interest in craft, doing contemporary craft. That's what he came in here to study. Mm -hmm. um, and I thought that the kind of experience at ITE where you're really getting to know a field through some making on your own, so there's, there's a great equalizer about a scholar being able to be on the shop floor with somebody mm -hmm. and learning a vocabulary, learning an approach that is not book-driven um, book yes. kind of scholarship. And I thought Glenn had all the other apparatus, and this would be an incredible opportunity for him to delve into it since your work previous to that had been a little bit more in ceramic line. Yeah. Um, so that you were intuitive in terms of being around circular motion. Yeah. It's something we talk a lot about now, hands-on learning that accompanies theoretical learning. But I think we were quite early on to that because of your own deep interest in craft as well. Yeah. So but, what did but, you um, get out of the ITE? Well, what Ned says is quite true, which is that I was very focused on ceramics when I first came to Yale. And Ned essentially said to me, have you ever considered wood? And uh, the ITE was really the gateway drug for being interested not only in contemporary wood turning, but actually historic furniture. And Pat, you and I work a lot on historic furniture over the course of my time here. And really, I think once I realized that you could look at two different materials, clay and wood, and that there was a lot of things held in common, it's a short step then to say, well, actually, you could look at any material this way. Yeah. So I went from being a ceramic specialist to somebody who was thinking about craft in a much more open, universally applicable way, including contemporary art. So it was that idea of um, lateral motion as well as circular motion. <laughs> and also, at any rate, the year I was there at ITE, you had so many different types of maker. So I met Palmer Sharpless also, and he gave me a turning lesson. Yep. And that's incredible, you know, basically production turner that could make spindles. At or industrial school. arts education, you know, so it gave you yeah. insight to exactly. what a school teacher was doing right. um, in the teaching of this particular subject. Right. And, and then who we else had, was there? Uh, so we had Meryl Salen, oh, who, wow. based in California, who's yeah. had, got a very painterly approach. Yes. And she almost was anti uh, technique in the sense that she scraped rather than cut yeah. uh, with a gouge. So she was um, very resistant to the competitive skill that often happens in the turning scene. So I had a great set of conversations with her about that. There was Mark Bishop, who was in from Tasmania. Tasmania. 
And so he was very interested in natural wood and the extraordinary timbers they have down there. Although on IT, he worked only in black and white. That's right. <laughs> he worked in maple and dyed it yeah. uh, black and yeah. bleached it. Interesting. Because he wanted to get away from... Anti-hue on pine. <laughs> yes, yes. Well, because he felt dependent on the grain and figure right. of the woods that he had been using. He wanted to just think about form, almost like a modernist yeah. Yeah. that summer. And then there was Christophe Nancy, who was working with pewter. Uh, right. melted pewter right. and putting it into the wood and then turning it, so somebody thinking about material experimentation. So it was a very interesting experience just to have that set of uh, very different aptitudes, different attitudes to the process. When did, when, when did we start with wood turning North America? Uh, I remember calling you and asking you, Charles and I, Charles Hummel, could, could, come, up. could come up and make a pitch mm -hmm. for an exhibition. And you introduce us to Pat. Mm. Uh, but great. I thought that you know that was another way of just sort of immersing yourself in all this. But it just sort of goes to how all these little steps all added up, and then ITE, mm. and then having Glenn come and ITE, and and then you know Glenn started working with Pat for the reinstallation of the American Decorative Arts um, mm -hmm. right around your third or fourth year, I think. That's right. Yeah. Um, right after your ITE fellowship, mm -hmm. so. Mm. You know, all these different kinds of connective tissues started to come together and, and made it sort of uh, almost a logical thing in terms of saying, what about doing this survey show? I also want to mention the Furniture Society because they had their first annual conference in Purchase, New York in 96. Yep. Mm, because this right. is the 20th year yep. this year. And that was extremely important for me as well um, because that was, again, meeting contemporary makers. Uh, maybe a broader range of critics and writers as well. Mm -hmm. Folks like Rick Mastelli, John Kelsey, getting to know them. So that was uh, that all happened at the same time for me, and it definitely enlarged the world of wood as far as I was concerned. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, I remember going through the slideshow, and uh, the first thing you said, Pat, well, I'm bowled over. <laughs> uh, and, oh, I was. I mean, and, you know... Um, I probably knew very little about the field at that point. Um, and um, I think the Waterberries, Dave and Ruth Waterbury, had um, uh, begun to give us a few things, but I really didn't know a lot. I guess our first contemporary wood turn piece was Ron Kent's Bowl, which he gave to us in 93. Uh, and I had heard of him because somehow he'd been exhibiting and whatnot. So when you showed all those slides, I mean, I was just amazed. I mean, some of these things were delicate and beautiful, and then you'd show these unbelievable wacky things, and it just had, and you, you talked about them, Albert, with such authority and passion mm -hmm. that I said, you know, this is somebody who really understands and wants other people to understand what is so great about this stuff. And, um, and of course, I knew um, Charles well from Winter Tour Day, so he added a layer of credibility. <laughs> a <And> little bit, <laughs> a little bit. <laughs> and, you know, Ned was in encouraging me to, to look at the slideshow and think about this idea. Something I remember you also saying is that you had some money, I believe, from the Waterberries to buy artwork, wood art, and you really didn't know what you were buying. And you said, I'm going to stop buying. There's other people in the same position, and I'm going to make the canon for the field. I'm going to do a book mm -hmm. that's going to help guide me and others through this field. And I really appreciated you taking on that position, but that's what we really wanted. This was the first exhibition that was not only curated by a team, but all the objects had a set position mm. in the exhibition that had to be in a certain order. Certain objects were going to be on a pedestal uh, together. Then there was a certain piece that was going to be next to it. Mm. I think that was a lot of your thinking that you brought to the table, Glenn, with your ideas on how the show should be laid out. And I remember uh, the Renwick saying to me, we do not understand the show at all. But it was after they were setting it up and they were looking at the chronology of the work 
-hmm. they say, we really get it now. Mm. And I think that's one of the beauties of the themes that you, we all created for the show, mm. uh, rather than a bunch of beautiful objects. So how did that come about? Yeah, I always uh, think to this day that a good show doesn't need labels. Labels are great and give you that additional layer of depth. But if the show speaks for itself visually, that's, that's really what you want. And that show definitely did that because the objects were talking to each other and there was this sense of development over time as well. But um, that was very important to me in my contribution, for sure. Well, I think that's one of the great things you brought to the project. I mean, you mm. really do, Glenn, have this I know this from working with you on the installation of mm -hmm. the American Galleries. Um, you, you, when we were doing those mock-ups, you really knew how to make juxtapositions of objects and how to make them tell a story. I mm -hmm. mean, you just really have that instinctual kind of ability. And mm -hmm. I think we leaned heavily on that skill and, mm -hmm. of yours in, oh, in designing the exhibition. Yeah, I but mean, to get to this point, uh, you assigned uh, Glenn and I to come up with a checklist. Yeah. Now we got to remember this is the 90s and the first thing we did, we came back to the center which was in my home at the time yeah. and went through the center's archives and looked at all the images and mm -hmm. picked out the objects that we really wanted to consider and then we actually traveled out to artist homes, collectors mm -hmm. and institutions they come up with a checklist. Yeah, that's As compared to today, you do so much by the internet. Yeah. But we went out and saw firsthand in the studio, I remember Mel and Mark Lindquist's studio sitting there with all that work yeah. and uh, getting also lessons in, in process. And that was maybe the most memorable thing, seeing them in Florida, because Mel was still alive. And then Mark is such a, an incredible, charismatic and thoughtful person with his own extremely strong opinions as well. Mm -hmm. And um, having all that work of Mel's, yeah. and to a lesser extent Mark's, not, not so many pieces of Mark's, but great pieces, yeah. that was just unparalleled, I think. Not only in that show, but almost any show I've ever worked on to have that kind of trove opened up. So going back to the show, I was going to say the next thing that really sticks in my mind, uh, which I think you guys didn't have a chance to do was to go to Albert's place in Philadelphia and actually write the object entries. That's right, in front of the objects. That's right, well when possible, yeah. when possible. Um, so we'd either have a great picture or we'd have the object if it were from the Wood Turning Center collection for example. Mm -hmm. And the process was, it was like being a medieval scribe for me. <laughs> so the process was Albert would just start talking about the piece and I would write things down and after maybe 45 minutes or an hour, we would usually have a rough paragraph about how the object should be described. But what was great is that sometimes we would get stuck and we would just pick up the phone and call the artist. <laughs> and it was, a, it was such a great lesson about the value of working with living artists. And I think every one of those object entries we wrote in, uh, it, we, we completely wrote together at a desk with me typing. Mm -hmm. I remember we would say I was steering. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 But we did it together, you know. Take, uh, but uh, a great body. No, it was a real team effort, yeah. and you really got a sense of that, of mm. different people contributing different skill sets, different. Yeah. As I said, the, the dream team, the dream curatorial team. Mm. Uh, I'll never forget, after each one of our meetings, we would get Hummel notes. Uh, <laughs> written on top of Humboldt, though these are the tasks we have to do between now and our next meeting, yeah. including he, budget. He did contribute organizational intelligence, for sure, mm -hmm. but he also had the deeper uh, history, because of course he had done all that great work on 18th century tooling and craft processes, and so, you know, obviously you know, you know a lot about that sort of thing as well, Ned, but he was often approaching it from a very long term perspective, the which I think was gray, very useful. Hey. Yeah, very useful. Yeah. So, uh, how did this exhibition experience and publication affect our lives afterwards? Uh, I know, Pat, you, you wanted to develop this canon for the field and hold off acquiring any work until 
this was done. So how's that affected you in the expansion of uh, Yale's collection of wood art? Well, you know, um, shortly after the show was first up, I guess in 2002, uh, Robin and John Horn invited me and um, Christopher Monkhouse yes. down to Arkansas to choose things that she was ready to give up from her collection or their collection. And um, I, in making those choices, I really was trying to create for Yale the the chronology that we had set forth in this book. And so um, with Ellsworth, you know, we didn't have maybe the, the first of his hollow vessel pieces, but one that was really very early. And um, um, so I, I constantly tried to match um, my choices to what we as a curatorial team had kind of figured out were the you know, important um, objects and statements. And th that gift, which included more than 40 things, as I recall, mm -hmm. was really gave us the core of the kind of chronology that we had set forth mm -hmm. in wood turning in North America. And, um, you know, the collection, as you said, Albert, we did have this fund that was established um, by the Waterberries and the Wingate Foundation that enabled us to buy certain things. Can I just mention, by the way, that the Horns also made a gift of uh, wood art pieces to the V&A when I was there at Victoria and Albert Museum. And that was a funny story on the V&A side because they have a furniture department and they have a, a lot of departments to think about vessels, ceramics, glass, metal. But nobody was thinking about what if it's made of wood and it's a vessel, which is what happens when you have very specialized curators. So I think it was the only one of the contemporary crafts that had no representation whatsoever in the V&A collection, just by virtue of this administrative oversight, really. And so I, I was, when I was the head of research there at the V&A, I approached the Horns and also other donors like Martha Cannell, who unfortunately mm -hmm. has passed away but she was very generous in giving a couple of pieces as well. And we did make this little capsule wood art collection, so now the v &A can say that it has some representation of American <laughs> wood turning yeah. and a few British and Irish pieces too. But the horns were the lead donors in that case as well. Yeah. I think it, the influence on me was much more broadly impactful than just knowledge of that one field. Because for me, the experience of being involved in a curatorial project of that scale so early in my career, which I felt so lucky to have the chance to do, that really became a template for me and a lot of other things that I went on to do. Uh, first at the Milwaukee Art Museum, then at the V&A, and then more recently at the Museum of Arts and Design. So a lot of the processes that I learned on the wood turning show, both logistical and intellectual, are things that I've reapplied over and over again. For sure. I mean, it, it was um, it was the best possible learning environment for me. Great. Yeah. Um, and you know, this year we've uh, been working with Anne Carlisle. Should I say a little bit about that? Yeah, sure. Yeah. yeah so, um, for the anniversary of the uh, of your involvement in the field, forty years in the field, um, and looking back on on this show, we've been working on this exhibition called Wood Revisited, mm -hmm. uh, which of course explicitly refers back to this project but in our discussions about how to approach that the idea came up that it would be great to have a graduate student play the same role for that exhibition that I had been able to play for Wood Turning in North America and so Anne Carlisle at the Bard Graduate Center has been putting together this exhibition which really looks at wood forming technologies that didn't exist when we did that show so you know new yeah. mostly digital technologies uh, also laser cutting uh, you know, CNC, those, ki those kinds of um, techniques. And she's just done a fantastic job of yeah. doing a kind of international survey of, of how these new processes are reshaping the possibility of wood sculpture and functional objects. Yeah. And quite different uh, position than we were in, in trying to find work. Most of the work was found through the internet, yeah. through references of teachers and people working with those techniques. Yeah. So in a much shorter period of time, she was able to identify some really great artists and great work. Yeah.
for the show. Yeah, it's come together quite quickly. But it's been interesting for me too to serve in the role of serve as a mentor instead yeah. of being the apprentice, which is what I was <laughs> with you guys. <laughs> so it took me about we 20 years. We can have you just sweep up shavings. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. But, um, but no, it's just really satisfying to see the, the wheel turn, the lathe turn. Yeah. Yeah. It's great.